Welcome back to the Agora uh, Cafe for uh, more coffee and philosophy. Uh, my interview with Sheldon Richmond uh, ended up running at in a, uh, nearly two and a half hours, and so I uh, uh, decided to uh, cut it in two, uh, like the two halves of Kill Bill. Um, uh, so uh, this is the second half, and so it will uh, it will start uh, in medias race. Uh, we just finished talking about uh, Sheldon's uh, first book, not not his first book, the first book that we talked about, um, the the first of his three most recent books we talked about, uh, the one on the Constitution uh, and the Constitutional Convention is a betrayal of the Articles of Confederation, and. Uh, now we're about to talk about the second of those two books, um, of those three books. I can't seem to keep my numbers straight. Um, well, it's just an arbitrary convention anyway, numbers, whatever. Um, uh, uh, about to talk about his uh, book on Palestine, and then I'm gonna talk about, uh, we will talk about his, um, uh, his third book, and then we'll talk about some other stuff. Um, we will talk and talk. Um, and, uh, uh, we, at the end of this, we won't really be finished talking, but we will stop. Um, but I think that uh, it's a good chance we want to come back and and revisit and talk some more. Actually, it's generally true of these interviews is that I, uh, I generally feel that um, uh, you know, we could, I could, these interviews could uh, benefit from uh, revisiting with, uh, uh, in many cases, a part two, although in this case, we have to be a part three. Anyway. So uh, we're now uh, resuming um, my conversation with Sheldon uh, in Medias Reis. Um, if you uh, don't remember who he is, um, you know, go back and watch the beginning of the, uh, uh, the first episode where uh, you know, I introduce him uh, and uh, uh, talk about his, uh, his books and his career. Uh, but now, uh, onward to the rest of the interview. Thank All right, so um, so moving on to uh, the next book, Coming to Palestine, a completely uncontroversial little book. Yeah, I, I go for things that won't, uh, you know, cause many ripples. I don't like to get attacked on Twitter. <laughs> um, well, that book also was many years in the making. I began writing about uh, the Middle East, Palestine, Israel, Palestine in uh, the late 80s when I was uh, at, no wait, yeah, I wasn't at Cato yet. I don't get to Cato until the 90s. So it's, uh, it was uh, maybe early 80s and then into the early 90s. I was a columnist for a while for the Washington Report on Middle East Affairs, which is a very good magazine still published today. Um, and I just started, uh, uh, you know, reading history, which I hadn't done. Uh, I. I told you in the beginning, I grew up in a middle-class conservative Jewish uh, home and was taught that Israel was very important. Israel's a key to Jewish identity. Jewish identity is important. Uh, and uh, I gave up God in, uh, when I was about 18, but I didn't give up, give up Israel till later on. Uh, and what, what helped to trigger that was I attended the very first Cato summer seminar at, uh, at uh, Wake Forest University in 1978. It was the very first student seminar they put on. Uh, in those days, you had to write a 500 word paper and then they picked 10 to be delivered. You know, you, you got to deliver it, you got to read it. Uh, so mine was about the, was not about the Middle East, it just pointed out. Oh, one little sidelight. I think I'm the only person who attended both the first and the last of those, those uh, student seminars. The first as an attendee, the last as a lecturer. I don't think anyone can claim that. Um, so anyway, uh, but I heard Leonard Liccio talking about imperialism. And I think Roy Childs also wrote, uh, well, also spoke on uh, whatever, he gave a couple talks, but one of them must have touched on imperialism too. And I remember asking him, because I, I was, I, someone had given me some Lockean defense of Israel. 
you know, they bought the land. And I hadn't looked into it. And I just said, well, okay. So I just filed that away. I started asking Roy and, and probably Leonard too. And they started suggesting I take a look at some stuff. And because uh, it's, yeah, that's not exactly a way, that's not a good account of, of what went on. So uh, uh, I remember I was in New York at one point, uh, not long after that, talking to Roy, Roy was with La Lazy for Books by then. And uh, he said, uh, here's a book you need to look at, David Hurst's The Gun and the Olive Branch, which has been through many editions. It's a pretty thick book, very good book. He's a reporter. Uh, he's not an activist, uh, but it's a very good book, and it's a it's a balanced book. But by balanced, I don't mean that it uh, it leaves you agnostic at the end. It's very clear, you know, who's the agreed party, and who and who's the aggressor. But it is a very fair book. Uh, he said you need to read this book. So I remember being at the Xerox machine. I hope the statute of limitations is run. Xeroxing <laughs> manually, you know, chapter by chapter. I don't know if I did the whole book, but just enough to get me going. And I started reading that, and of course, that was a big eye opener. Uh, and, and so from there, I started meeting people. I mean, I would talk to Murray about it, Rothbard about this. Uh, he then put me in touch with Rabbi Elmer Berger, who was like the last of the great anti Zionist reform rabbis. I mean, there's still probably some around, but nobody was as dominant a figure. One of his books is called Memoirs of an Anti Zionist Jew. It's a great book, and his stuff is fantastic. Uh, so I just started reading. I was reading Chomsky, I read Edward Said. Probably I was reading more Jews, or at least people of Jewish heritage. They probably weren't active, believing, practicing Jews, uh, who were anti-Zionist. And, and then I, it opened my eyes to anti-Zionism. And then I recalled a, mem a memory of my grandfather. My grandfather was Orthodox, now not Hasid, you know, not, not the kind of the crazy with the big hats and the, and the uh, payas. Uh, I guess it's just considered modern Orthodox, right? I mean, he did all the observance, but he dressed pretty conventionally. He kept his head covered, but didn't have a long beard, had a short beard. Uh, I remember after the 67 war, or maybe while the 67 war was on, and uh, Israel, you know, demolished the, uh, air, the uh, air forces of uh, Egypt and the other Arab countries before the planes had gotten off the ground. And it was the six, it only lasted six days. And this is when the territories are occupied, West Bank and Gaza Strip. Uh, so... Uh, I remember my parents, we used to go over to see him every Saturday afternoon after uh, synagogue. I was, I was 64, this was, was 67, so I was 17. I turned 18 later in the year, but I was 17, it was June. Uh, and I hadn't thought much about this stuff. I was not doing any reading. I wasn't, uh, I was not, uh, I wish I had been far more precocious than I, than I was. But my parents were saying like, uh, isn't it wonderful what's, you know, how the Israelis being threatened have prevailed. And my grandfather is this little joyous Orthodox uh, Lithuanian Jew, wonderful guy, he came over to the US before World War I, although lost a lot of family in the Holocaust, but I don't even know the real reason, the, the reason why he came so early, but he did just looking for opportunity, I guess. Anyway, I hear, I hear him say, and I'll never forget it, the Jews are the cause of all the problems over there. It's kind of exactly probably verbatim. And my mother said, how can you say that? Look what they've done there. The desert, they made the desert bloom. You really ought to go. I wouldn't set foot in that place. Well, I never heard that any, that kind of talk from anybody. And this is from our sage grandfather, right? The wise, the wise man who's reading the Talmud all the time and talks about Rashi and uh, the Rambam, Maimonides. And, you know, he knew those books. That's what he spent his time doing. By then he was he was retired. He had been a house painter, paper hanger, you know, kind of guy sing, little company, little his own firm. Uh, but by then he was just running a little synagogue. He wasn't a rabbi. He had a good voice. He could be a cantor. And, but he was, I think they just chalked it up to, well, it's getting old or that's the, maybe that's the Orthodox. I didn't know that the Orthodox in, in, originally were anti-Zionist and I didn't know the reformer anti-Zionist. Now all that's kind of faded, right? especially once the state got, got established, all that kind of faded. And now the lines are blurred and it's hard to tell who's a conservative, who's an Orthodox, or who's an Orthodox, who's, who's a conservative, who's a reform. Uh, but I have since, you know, over the last you know, 20 years, 30 years, have gotten up to speed on that stuff by, by reading lots of things. And so I started doing articles, first, uh, uh, like I said, the Washington Report, 
I wrote for the uh, Institute uh, for the Journal of Palestine, Study, Palestine Studies, published by the Institute for Palestine Studies, uh, and a few other journals, Middle East Journal, a few other things. And, uh, and then I started writing, and then I didn't write for a, while, for a while. I just was turning to other things. I was a Freeman for 15 years, so my mind was on other things. And I wasn't fully keeping up. I was aware I was going on. But then once I got to the Libertarian Institute, I wrote a few more things. Scott Horton encouraged me. There was stuff going on. And I wrote, and I started reading Shlomo Sand, a very important historian. His first book, uh, The Invention of the Jewish People. And then he's got a trilogy, The Invention of the Land of Israel. And then the last one, which is a more personal statement. Uh, I thought it was originally going to be called The Invention of the Secular Jew, but it's called How I Stopped Being Jewish. Uh, but he's a very good historian. And it was an eye-opening book, uh, all three books, eye-opening. And I started writing articles, you know, f based on his book, citing him, quoting him, and bringing in other people. Israel Shahak, a great uh, Israeli human rights activist, who was a classical liberal, by the way, uh, somebody I knew exchange letters with. Uh, and then uh, Scott said one day, you know, he played the Gary Chartier part in, for this book. Why don't you put all that stuff together? So I said, well, is there enough? And I started gathering the stuff from the early days, the 80s and into the 90s. And I wrote some stuff for Cato. I wrote a big thick paper for Cato at the time. It was the thickest policy analysis they had published called Ancient History. It hit, uh, basically uh, an account of US intervention in the Middle East since the end of World War II. Uh, up to 1991, so it came out in 91. It's pretty thick and very I'll link to it. It is online at Cato, PDF, and it's heavily, that's heavily footnoted, lots of footnotes there. Now that's not in my book. That uh, was very thick and it was beyond, that was beyond Palestine anyway. That was about everything. Mm -hmm. That was right around the time of the, Iraq, the first, you know, the Gulf War, the first Iraq War. So I, I said, I guess there is enough for a book here. There wasn't just gonna be a little booklet. And so, Scott, you know, he did all kind of the mechanical work. I just read through the stuff and gathered it and tweaked it where I thought it needed tweaking, a little bit of updating here and there. And that came out last year, last April. What kind of pushback have you gotten for that? Because a lot well, of people will react to criticism of Zionist policy as though it's, I know. Uh, you know, criticism of, um, you know, either just putting up anti-Semitic or at least it's a criticism of, of uh, you know, ordinary uh, Jewish people in Israel uh, or yeah. whatever. Um, so we, well, how, how, what kind of I, uh, I guess I'm not a very important person because I, I seem to be just under the radar. I didn't get attacked. I mean, it, look, on Facebook, if I put up an article, either mine or uh, someone else's, that's taking a, an anti-Zionist position or a pro-Palestinian position. I mean, my position, to put it in one quick sentence is the Palestinians are the aggrieved party, which doesn't mean no Palestinian ever violated the rights of his of an yeah, Israeli no, Jew. Yeah, of course, yeah, I'm not I mean, saying you know, that. there are right. you know, there are uh, there there are unjust ways of retaliating yeah, against exactly injustice. But but you you can't say you can't use that to then forgive all the violence that the Israelis have inflicted on Palestinians over the years, supported by most American Jews. Now that's changing because of the young, younger generation coming up. Uh, but the Palestinians are the aggrieved party. The Israeli Jews are the oppressor class. There's no two ways about it, uh, which is one reason why, uh, one reason why Sand has excommuted himself, a la Spinoza, from Judaism. I mean, he's also an atheist, so that'd be one reason. I mean, although, there are lots of lots of atheists who, who consider themselves Jewish atheists. I don't quite understand that. Well, in fact, I know uh, I know some atheist Jews who uh, actually keep kosher because it's they want to have a um, or at least keep kind of sort of kosher um, because it's a way of connecting to their cultural heritage. Yeah, and they can't well, do I, it I through religion, so they do it through that. Right. I, I but I just don't get attacked. Give a I don't for the sake of their of their cultural heritage. Well, but Sam makes an important point. You know, he, he says he's not sure what a secular Jew is because he, as he puts it, and I think he's right about this. There's no, there's no uh, secular Jewish culture, ro worldwide secular Jewish culture. Take away all the, separate the religious practices, beliefs, stuff like that. There's nothing left that you are gonna call secular Jewish. Now, some people will say, well, what about, you know, the Yiddish, the Yiddish? But the Yiddish is not Jewish. 
the Yiddish is a, of, a, of, of a particular time and place, Jewish, but Eastern Europe for a limited amount of time, a couple hundred years. Uh, and so Yiddish humor, as say filtered through what Mel Brooks and Woody Allen in Brooklyn, uh, is not something that a Yemeni Jew is going to necessarily find funny or an Iraqi Jew. Now these days in, with globalization, there's a, cultures are kind of coming together across all kinds of lines just because people have contact with it through, you know, Netflix or uh, you know YouTube, and so that's changing a little bit. But there's no reason to think that a uh, a Moroccan Jew who's culturally Arab, speaks Arabic, would have spoken Arabic, maybe also French, uh, would uh, be laughing at uh, Tevye in Fiddler on the Roof or sitting through uh, Yiddish theater, which was a quite developed, well-developed Yiddish theater, uh, and, and getting it. In other words, that's not Jewish, that's Yiddish. It's not the same thing. And, th and this is something that uh, San writes about. So San says, you know, he doesn't understand. Look, people are free to call themselves secular Jews. They can identify themselves as secular Jews and have other people accept that identification. Fine. Let them, uh, you know, live and be well, as my, my grandmother would say. But he still wants to know what it is. The other objection he has to it is it's a closed, it's, an, it's, an, it's a restricted club. Because how does someone become, someone who's not Jewish, how does someone become a secular Jew? He said, I don't want to be a member of a restricted club. So if you're religious Jew, you, have to, you, can, you can convert to Judaism and become a religious Jew, but it's harder to see how you convert. Well, I came up with a way. Get your mother to convert to Judaism. That's true. And then That's you true. declare yourself a secular Jew, but I don't think that would work. <laughs> I don't know if that carries over to you. I don't know if, you know, it does come through the mother's line, but I don't know if it's uh, uh, retroactive. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think if your mother converts, you then become Jewish. I have never asked that question of a rabbi. I, I need a time machine question. to make it work out. So I don't mind calling, you know, I don't regard myself as a Jew. First of all, I think Judaism is monotheistic and I think it dishonors monotheistic Jews for me, for a, an atheist to call himself a Jew, personally. Uh, I mean, I was always taught, you know, uh, the Jews uh, in Germany died uh, reciting the most, you know, holy prayer, right? Hero Israel, the Lord is one. The Lord is God, the Lord is one. So it seems to me uh, it doesn't honor them for an atheist to claim to be a Jew. And it doesn't matter if you eat gefilte fish. I mean, I can eat Chinese food every night of the week. Does that make me culturally Chinese? Uh, I don't think so, but that's not a religion anyway. I think that yeah. uh, you know, for most of the Jews I've known, eating Chinese food might be sort of more, more definitive than eating <laughs> filled with fish, of course, I haven't noticed remarkable. That's right, especially food. Christmas Christmas Day, <laughs> yeah. when that's probably the only thing open. <laughs> that's a tradition for some people. So that's true. So. Like I say, I seem to fly under the radar. I mean, I guess I wish I got a little more heat. It, it can be too much. I mean, you look at, look at how Norman Finkelstein and other people have suffered, right? Dershowitz basically stopped them from getting tenure at DePaul because of his, uh, his, uh, his books. But he's an extremely good researcher, and I think a very honest researcher. I've read a ton of his stuff. Uh, I, you know, I'm ignored. I mean, I promote the books on, on I promoted that book on social media when it first came out and, uh, and you know, blog about it. And, but the, I never got attacked. I mean, well, Facebook, there might be a negative Maybe you'll get some attacks from this video. We can, we can always hope. I mean, I haven't been called anti-Semitic, um, but of course I would, I would have to be called, I guess, self-hating. But, um, you know, my answer to that is I ought to be self-hating, but I just, can't manage it. I mean, I have grounds for to be self-hating, but I just can't pull it off. So I'm sorry. And I think Finkelstein or somebody says, uh, well, who was it? Somebody says, maybe it wasn't him. I hate myself, but the, being Jewish is the least reason for that. <laughs> <laughs> By the way, going back to uh, what you said earlier about, um, about confessing about the uh, possible misuse of, um, of, uh, the um, photocopier place you're working. I have a worse confession to make, which I've never made before, and I'll now make it. When I was at the Social Philosophy and Policy Center uh, in Bowling Green, Ohio, um, back in uh, 91 to 92, I think, um, and I was there on the weekend, I was the only one in the building, there was a photocopier there, and I decided to perform an experiment, which is I made a photocopy of my hand 
and then I photocopied the photocopy, and then I photocopied the photocopy, and so forth. I was curious to see how many iterations would go before the, the hand just faded out and became invisible. So I ended up with this thick stack of papers of uh, you know increasingly fainter um, uh, copies of my hand, which I think is is uh, surely a a greater abuse of uh, <laughs> of a of a photocopier I had access to than what you were doing. Um, oh, but I was thinking of copyright. I wasn't thinking of abusing the photocopier. Oh, I was thinking of a copyright issue. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, I, no one thinks my hand's copyrighted. Um, I don't think Roy Charles. Roy Charles didn't mind. No, I was just Roy thinking Charles didn't it, was mind the, it was abuse of corporate resources. <laughs> oh, I see. I, I don't think Andrea Rich or uh, or Roy Charles minded. I was doing it out in the open. I was in a closed room. Oh, no, I, I was worried. I suspect there would have been less than total enthusiasm for what I was doing if people had known that that's what I was doing with them. Uh, well, at least it wasn't uh, any other part of the anatomy. Let me say that. <laughs> okay, no, I stuck to the hand. Because <laughs> there, there's been lots of funny stuff about, you know, other, yeah, other uh, parts. Anyway, yeah, we'll no, let no, go. I didn't go there. Um, <laughs> so <laughs> somebody attacked me and I don't get attacked. <laughs> All right, let's I mean, if you can't get attacked on writing a book in defense of Palestine, what do you have to do? What do you have to do to get a, what's this guy have to do to get attacked around here? Let's talk a little bit about your most recent book, What Social Animals Owe to Each Other, which is, uh, I think, the only bo book of yours I haven't read yet, although I've read a number of the, looking at the table of contents, I guess yeah. I've read a number of the articles yes. that gone into it, but I'm not sure I've read all of them. Uh, can you say a little bit about that? Again, it's a collection going back to, I think, when I started TJF, which would take it back to 2006. Uh, so again, it wasn't written, I didn't write these things with a book in mind. Uh, but I did have a, th a theme in mind for a lot of that time. Now, I didn't always write every article on that theme, but I became extremely interested in the concept of social cooperation back then. And the first, the second and third chapters are actually social cooperation part one and social cooperation part, part two. Those were early TGIFs. Uh, and I started reading what the Austrians were saying about social cooperation and Herbert Spencer and, you know, just the liberal tradition, because there, you know, you just see so much criticism of of the of libertarianism or the liberal tradition uh, along the lines that, uh, to put it in the, the real sort of caricature way, uh, you'd think that the libertarian ideal was Ted Kaczynski without the letter bombs, right? Living in a shack in Montana, off the grid, never seeing another person, growing whatever food he can eat, putting together whatever clothes you know he can wear, and that's it which is of course ridiculous. I mean, it's either dishonest or it's really abject ignorance for a critic of libertarianism to think that has anything to do with libertarianism. Uh, so I started again, just gathering stuff and just doing more narrowly pitched articles, one at a time, uh, pretty much on a weekly basis. Uh, and I came across the fact that uh, hum uh, that uh, Mises was, a, was originally thinking of calling human action social cooperation. So I, there's something else I have in common with Mises. I could have called my book social cooperation, uh, but I didn't. And so- uh, But your I title started, is you know, borrowed or adapted from a, a famous- uh, Yes. Best liberal uh, book title. That's true. I mean, I'd written this essay called What Social Animals Owe to Each Other, which again, another thing inspired by you. If you've read that, you'll know uh, that, that draws on quotes you quite a bit, uh, draws on, uh, oh, reason and value, and I, I forget what else, but a few other things where you talk about Aristotle and political political animal, social animal. And, and I'm glad I hit on that. I, I think it's a, gr a good title. I almost called the book, because uh, I think there's another essay by this, this title, uh, Market State on, and Autonomy. I always thought, I got to have a book that has the three, you know, a three tripartite, you know, man, economy, and state, and every state utopia. There's all lots of books that do that. I thought, hey, oh, I was a law firm saying manicotti and steak. I thought it was a dinner order. Well, it's funny you thought of that because I independently years ago, as a, one of my one-liners, I do pride myself on the one-liner, that I wanted to set up a libertarian uh, restaurant and, there, you know, the, the dishes would be named after famous libertarians and the Rothbard would be manicotti and steak. So you came up with that steak. When's manicotti and steak? And steak, right. Yeah. So we independently came up with that. Isn't that interesting? Make mine steak. Uh, no, I have a friend who independently had the same thought. And he was he had the Robert Nozick, which was uh, tapioca and anchovies. 
something like that. <laughs> <laughs> no, tapioca steak and anchovy. Yeah, anarchy steak and, 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 uh, and utopia. Anarchy steak and utopia. Yeah, so. Anchovy, anchovies. The anchovy steak and, and <laughs> tapioca. Uh, anyway, that's going to doesn't work as well as manicotti and steak. I'm getting, I know. I, that's, I have to, that's brilliant, I think. And I'll, you too. Uh, anyway, I'm, it's making me hungry, so let's get off the subject. Uh, so I just started reading what Menger and others in that tradition were saying about about the social cooperation that led me to uh, Spencer, who I'd read some of, but uh, you also were getting me interested in Spencer. Getting, I had you write about Spencer for the Freeman. And so I started reading in uh, like the principles of sociology and other places where he talks about that. Uh, and he makes this very interesting point about how it seems paradoxical, but as as society progresses and becomes uh, moves, you know, into the uh, the industrial uh, mode, you get it. You get a heightened individuality and a heightened. I forget how he puts it, but collective, collective, not collectivism, but you know, uh, social cooperation. So you get both intensifying kind of at the same time. And while it seems paradoxical, it's not paradoxical. It's easily resolved. And so I quote, I quote that. I discuss that. Uh, and so I just tried to carry on. And uh, in some ways, it looks like I was appealing to the left, because one of my themes in many of the articles that, uh, that are in this volume is, is saying to like a good faith state leftist, I have to say that to distinguish me from left libertarians, but the more conventional, the way we think of leftists conventionally, um, we can deliver what you want. And you can't. And here's how. And so by drawing on people like Bastiat and uh, and uh, Bombavirk and all, uh, all these other people, I, I end up pointing out, and uh, Hayek, I point out that the market the, and the free society really is social control of the means of production, not in the legal sense, but in the uh, actual real sense. And the example I use is, you know, Borders, the book chain went out of business a few years ago. Uh, who put it out of business? Well, in a sense, we did. We, quote, decided that we didn't need the resources. We, our book, our book uh, producing uh, was being taken care of and those resources might be better used somewhere else. We didn't sit down in a meeting and argue you know, all night and then vote. We just threw our behavior- I would have voted the other way. I loved borders. They were better well, than Noble. <laughs> the, in a democracy, there's a minority, tough luck. Yeah. It's the tough, it's the tough luck uh, theory. But that sounds a lot like collective control. Uh, but not in the way uh, that left. Of course, I know. I didn't. I didn't necessarily vote with my dollars because the nearest borders was in Atlanta, so I didn't get to Atlanta all that often. So I, I probably ordered from Amazon uh, more a lot more often than I made it out to Atlanta. Right, but the, the borders again. It's, you know, I would I would have voted voted for borders if I could have. <laughs> it's it, it's this unplanned order that happens, and it's it's as if it's as if we sat down and took a vote, and you would have been in the minority. But, the, but nevertheless, so I'm trying to, in various ways, try to show good faith leftists of that ilk, that um, we really are talking about what you want, but we don't need force. And we don't have the, pro the discoordination problems that come from central planning and all these different things. Uh, you know, I have this chapter on Bastia, which nobody seems to appreci appreciate. I don't mean they don't appreciate my chapter. It's based on chapter 11 of economic harmonies. Chapter 11, well, that's why they think it's morally bankrupt. <laughs> Uh, where he, it's called from private property to common wealth, two words, from private property to common wealth. And he says that as technology advances and, as comp and, and when competition is free, then stuff you used to have to pay for is, becomes free. That's to sum it up. And, and so he says wealth moves from the realm of private property to the, to the communal, this is his, these are his words, the communal realm, and think about it for a minute, right? If the, if the if the real prices of real prices of things are falling, then what you uh, if you were paying uh, you know uh, X for a chicken ten years earlier, and now you're paying half of that, then you're kind of you're getting half. Uh, let's assume no increase in uh, quality, right? Uh, you, you're getting half of the value. You're sorry, you, you're getting half of the value for free. You don't have to. You don't have to labor to buy that other half, and that's happening all over the place. But but you need two things: tech, technological innovation 
And, all, and as Bastia puts it, all that does, what that means is, I shouldn't say all that does, what it means is we're substituting the free services of nature for onerous effort, human labor. So the sun, gravity, water, electricity, we're harnessing that. That takes human labor to do the harnessing, but what are we harnessing? We're harnessing the free services of, of mother nature. If you try to charge for that, a competitor will jump in and undercut your price. And eventually the free, the services will be, those free services will actually be free because they won't be captured, will be free to the consumer because they won't be captured by the seller if there's competition. Now you might say, well, with IP, what about that? But here's where Bastiat's so great. He doesn't directly discuss IP, but he was pro imitation. Uh, David Hart uh, sent me a letter that, uh, that he had translated of Bastiat's where he's praising imitation. Now it's the key to civilization. So he couldn't have been for IP. And he, he also says in the chapter, he, he anticipates, well, if the person can keep the method secret, can he capture? And he said, you know what he said? You can't keep those ideas secret for very long. He doesn't talk about IP patents. And, it doesn't specifically, but he does say, in effect, those secrets will not be secret for long. So I think that means. Yeah, Bastiat really doesn't get enough respect, even among libertarians, who often respect him as yeah. like, you know, as like a brilliant and persuasive economic journalist. But they tend not right. to respect him as uh, as a Which theater. Is, and and uh, uh, the, you know, a lot of his stuff is really valuable. It's a shame. Taking, that, it's a shame that liberty to be discontinuing the. Uh, the process since David Hart has has been yeah ejected unfortunate, unfortunate. Uh, as uh, uh, yeah and I think I think the process think, uh, of doing that you know, complete collection if I don't know if, I don't know if younger libertarians are reading or you're not just talking about long, younger libertarians but but it's Schumpeter right who who said that Bastiat was not an economist he was an economic journalist which is a shame economic harmonies is a very good book it's a very good people book. don't read that they and, read you know they read the petitions of the candle makers they read the law, yeah. they read what is seen and what is not seen. And those are all great right. essays. Uh, he never finished, that was and I think, and I think those, those are philosophically, I mean, um, Guido Hilsman has a nice piece on um, on uh, on the role of counterfactuals in economic law, which is really making the point that even what is seen and what is not seen is really making a deeper theoretical point, which yeah. even has it to some extent uh, may have missed. But uh, what's disappointing to me is, well, for, lots of people don't read Economic Harmonies, but even people who know the book Economic Harmonies, a very knowledgeable person about Bastia, I asked him about chap that chapter 11. And he said, uh, I never really understood that chapter. And I was just flabbergasted. Mm -hmm. I don't see how you could not understand it. Now, here's the other thing Bastia says in this. He says, I know that I am going to get accused of being a communist. Because he's talking about value or uh, utility. I forget, you know, he's got... Uh, Kind of idiosyncratic uh, uses of those words. I forget which is which for him. He see, you know, he's saying that's moving from the realm of private property to the communal realm. That's his term. And he, he's, he, you know, he laughs. He says, I, I'm sure I'm going to get accused of being a communist for talking like this. And I open up with a quote about that saying, who said this? You know, uh, and I named some famous <laughs> communists, Eugene Debs, or, you know, I named some people. Uh, no. Well, mostly, oh. we, you know, Mostly didn't accuse him of being a communist. They just didn't read the chapter or didn't say anything about it. Um, I don't know. Uh, I don't understand why. I, well, maybe I do understand why. Maybe it was, people were uncomfortable with that chapter. Because it just, it sounds too, I mean, free, it's talking about free, delivering free stuff, but that's yeah, the kind of appeal. With the, with the sort of the right wing vibe that has been part of the libertarian culture for a long time it wasn't always uh right you know, particularly right. Look at the 19th century individualist anarchists like my spanish lysander spooner and benjamin tucker and so forth exactly uh, there was much more of a left-wing cultural vibe with a lot of them um and i say repeatedly in this book that if we that that if we want to talk to the good faith non-libertarian left th these are the kinds of things we need to explain and that it's uh, it's it's important it's not just pandering I, I have been accused of just pandering, misusing Mises, misusing. Oh yeah, me too. To pander to the left, I'm sure. Yeah, you've heard that. Uh, but no, it's a completely honest thing. The the point is, look at this. We can deliver what you say you want, but we don't have to kill anybody or or give or issue orders to anybody. What I like that. So, 
I find lots of ways to do that, not just through Bastia, but through Bamba Verk, who's got this uh, great piece about uh, how co uh, pr cost of production, cost of production determines price, which seems like an un Austrian thing. This is something George Reisman has been pounding away at for years and couldn't get anybody to listen to him. And I, f and I was aware he was doing this, and I finally read that, that paper by Bamba Verk, uh, and uh, I did an article, it's in this book, about why Bamba Verk is right about that. Now, it doesn't take uh, marginal utility out of the picture. It's mm -hmm. the marginal utility determines the cost of production, and then cost of production determines prices. Well, he did get the, the, he did get the Mises book to publish the Bumba Verk's piece plus his commentary on it in the um, quarterly yeah, journal. Yeah, that's right. That's right. So when, when I did my chap, my, when I, I did my TGIF. embraced the idea that they were willing to publish it. When I wrote my TGIF, right, and Murray didn't like it either. I remember talking to Murray about it. When I wrote my uh, TGIF about that chapter, and, I, and of course I linked to George and mentioned that George had been writing about this, I got one of the nicest emails I'd ever gotten in my life. He said like, Finally, someone gets it. It was something like, it's like ecstatic. And I, I felt very good about it because I have total confidence in the thesis. I think George and Bomberwerk are right about that. It doesn't take marginal utility out of the picture. It just is more roundabout to use a Bomberwerkian uh, concept anyway. It is more roundabout. Uh, and it's, a, it's an, I could describe it, I could explain it quickly, but it would, it's kind of involved, so it's probably not the place. I'll have a link to it in the description. So anyone who wants to see what we're talking yeah. about, uh, look in the description, there will be a link. But the point is that with competition, prices get, are driven down. The question is how, how low can they go? And cost of production sets the lower limit. It's not gonna to go to zero because who's gonna sell if the price is zero. So something above zero provides the floor. What's the floor, how's the floor determined? Cost of production. Cost of production though is the result of the marginal utility of alternative uses of the resources. Anyway, that's the quick, that's the quickie. Okay, I thought we might finish up by talking about your uh, your logical atheist blog. Um, <laughs> okay. By the way, I'm, I'm probably going to split this interview into into two halves since it, okay, uh, you know, since we're already at two hour mark. But I I'm not I'm not willing to stop yet. I want to want to talk a little bit about the um, logical atheist sure. blog. I'll cut it in two, and um, but uh, you know, people will get to enjoy uh, both. So. Tell me what you're doing on this uh, logical. Well, I, I wanted something. I wanted to do something new during the pandemic. There's, <laughs> there's the first thing. Uh, and it was a way. If God, if God sent the pandemic to us, as Pat Robertson and whatnot, whoever else thinks, I figured this was a way to get back at God. Right? This is my revenge. Uh, so, so I set up a blog. Doesn't cost anything. Blogger is free. Uh, and I. I set it up on April 4th and actually I haven't missed a day since. I don't know how long I'll keep that going. A lot of it is I haven't been aware of that blog until recently, but I, you know, I've been looking through it recently. And uh, Well, you're busy. I mean, I told you, I actually told you about it quite a while ago, but I'm sure it just- Quite possibly. As I said, my memory is not what it used to be. What, what, what helped the prompt it was, I was watching a lot of, uh, a lot of them don't like this name, but I was watching a lot of the, the so-called new atheists on YouTube, there, there are plenty of debates and lectures by some big names, Dawkins, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, uh, very entertaining ones by Christopher Hitchens. Uh, and then there's a sort of the next tier that are sort of internet celebrities uh, who, uh, uh, now a lot of them don't like the word the new, new atheism. Uh, I think one reason for that term is, is that uh, uh, Hitchens and Harris and others were inspired to kind of go public with their atheism to make it an actual cause after 9-11 because they thought 9-11 could be, was totally explained by crazy Muslims, right? Hating our way, our freedom, hating our freedom, to use the George Bush thing. Uh, I think they're wrong about that. Uh, it's much more politics. It's like with Palestine, right? It's it, tiny, tiny bit of its religion, if any of it is, and an awful lot of it is politics and yeah, it an unjustified form of retaliation against yeah, an unjustified. Right. But it's not political. It's not, the, the motivation is not religious. I mean, that may be in part of the mix, but it's not, I don't, I don't believe it's the main motor of, of the thing. It's certainly true of the Palestinian Israeli conflict. A lot of Palestinians are, uh, are secular. The PLO and Arafat were a secular organization. Uh, anyway, uh, I watched a lot of this stuff and I was really annoyed by how philosophically shallow it is. 
Now, of the top four, the, four, the people they call the four horsemen of the apocalypse, then it's the only philosopher. Then it, interestingly enough, was a student of two very famous philosophers who have single syllable names, Quine and Ryle. Uh, Ryle, I wonder if he's not spinning in his grave at some of the things, uh, <laughs> some of the things written uh, by Dennett about consciousness, but I won't go into that. I'm hardly an expert on that. But uh, yeah. anyway, the others are not. About another time, though, I would I would like yeah. to come back to that, those issues. Harris is a neuroscientist, right? Uh, Hitchens is a journalist. I mean, he's widely read, but not much of a philosopher. Uh, and what's his name? Uh, Dan, uh, Dawkins is a biologist, I believe, evolutionary biologist. Mm -hmm. uh, and so there's a, just a lot of bad philosophy, shallow, not just when they talk about ethics, which I think there's, you know, problems with that, but just the way they defend. And the, their view is that the, the God hypothesis, which I think somebody wrote a book called the God hypothesis, one of them wrote a book called I the God that hypothesis. Is that uh, Dennett? Dawkins? I think, I can't remember. Dawkins who. is the God delusion. Okay, yeah. I think it may be Dennett. Uh, they see it as simply a scientific hypothesis that the proponents of, uh, of which haven't yet produced the evidence. So they ought to be out there testing. And look, my views on, I, I came across atheism by reading Ayn Rand, and, but in particular, listening to the that 10 uh, lecture, the famous 10 lecture series, right? The Principles of Objectivism, where Brandon has a very good lecture on atheism. It's the, the concept of God or something. It's a, it's a single uh, cassette. I had it in cassette form years ago. And it's, it's very, you can find it on YouTube, by the way. Just to, it's great. It's very good. Now, typically, you know, they don't give credit to any other thinkers. <laughs> pretty much. I, don't, I don't know if they mention anybody else. That so I'm sure, of, I'm sure the stuff I absorbed from that, yeah, had been said before. But that, that was a very, that was the first time I ever heard it presented. And to show you, maybe it, it, it reveals something about my own commitment. I mean, I was a believer in some way, but I guess it shows you the, the, the depth of my, or lack of thereof, of my commitment. I listened to that lecture, it takes about an hour, and I said, okay, I'm an atheist. So that kind I read of about people. Of my, when I first decided that I was an anarchist, I remember telling both my mother and my ex-girlfriend that I had become an anarchist, and they both said, oh, I thought you already were. <laughs> 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 well, I kept it from my parents and I was living at home. When I went to Temple, I lived at home. So it really galled my parents later when they realized they, they, under, they can understand a kid goes off to college, falls in with the wrong crowd, becomes an atheist. I was upstairs by myself reading and listening and they never knew it. And that, that really got to them when, they, when I finally had the reveal. It was like coming out of the closet, basically. It wasn't really traumatic. They didn't disown me. They didn't scream. I, but my mother wanted to know, why are you giving up something for nothing? And I should have said, praxeologically, that's impossible. But I didn't say that. <laughs> well, I ended up converting my mother to so, anarchism, so, so there wasn't a problem. Not very good. Well, I, I turned to anarchism in, in like with the drop of a hat also. You know, it took me a much letter, better. which was... Uh, you know, I, I, became a, you know, I became a libertarian in high school reading, you know, reading Ayn Rand, and it wasn't until yeah. I was... Uh, you know, my first year teaching at Chapel Hill that I finally made it all the way to anarchism. I had a sort of embarrassingly long evolution. So I gave up religion, but it was 18. A lot of people do it way earlier than that. So I'm kind of, uh, I, I was hearing Chomsky the other day saying he was 12 or 13. I feel, I feel bad. And by, by the way, I wish I, I had been it. I would have been it. 12 too, didn't she? Something like I would have been, yeah, I forget. I would have had such questions for my grandfather. It would have been fantastic because he was a very tolerant person. I can't believe I blew that opportunity. Why not? I'd love to go back in time just to talk to him. Uh, anyway, uh, but it, so, okay, so I, I gave up religion at 18 and uh, it like, that was 1968. And I, uh, but I didn't think much about it after that. It wasn't gonna be something I was gonna be writing about, right? I just, okay, that's just another thing I incorporate. Uh, but then in 1974, George, uh, George Smith's book comes out, George A. Smith's book, book Atheism, uh, the Case the Against, against God. God. Right. Which, if you think about it, was, was a, a real major elaboration of the Brandon Lecture. And he cites Brandon in there. But he draws on many philosophers, you know, George. There's a lot of familiarity with, with intellectual. Widely history. read in philosophy and, and he history likes to cite and them. history of thought. Oh, yeah. Oh, and it's a marvelous book. You learn, 
aside from the God issue, you learn a heck of a lot about philosophy and epistemology and the metaphysics in that book, leaving away the, the God debate, the God question. It's just, it's just a wonderful book. It's, yeah, it's I was, in, the, I was in a reading group on that book at some point in my life, although I cannot remember whether it was here in Auburn or in Chapel Hill or where, or at IHS or where the heck it was. But I, I was in a reading group on that book at some point in my life. Yeah. No, it's a, it's a fantastic book. And I've read, I've, you know, I've reread, not cover to cover many times, but certainly I've gone back to sections multiple times. So I've probably in effect read the book, the whole book many times. It's a very readable book. I have a, my original hard copy, which was published by Nash, I think. And then I have a Kindle version of it. So I, I have it always at the ready. Uh, so to, to bring it back to the blog, that was 74. To bring it back to the blog, I noticed as I'm watching these debates, whether it's between two atheists or with an atheist and some well-known theist, Christian uh, theist, uh, I noticed George Smith is never mentioned. They're only, they mention Dawkins, they mention Dennett, they mention Harris, they'll mention uh, Hitchens. Uh, I had also read Anthony Flew, by the way, God and Philosophy, I think before, before uh, George's book came out. I'm sure that's true. Uh, Flew's a whole other story we can talk about sometime, about whether he actually became a theist on his deathbed. I, don't believe it. But anyway, I'm saying, where's George Smith's name? The book's in print. It's published by Prometheus, right? It was one of the great humanist publishing houses. Paul Kurtz, I guess, did he die? I think he died. One of the great humanist publisher of magazines and books, and that book is still in print. Unfortunately, George's follow-up book, Why Atheism, is not in print. That's, un that's unfortunate. Uh, he, so also, he thought, also has a collection thought, called Atheism, Ayn Rand, and Other yes, Heresies. Yes, Ayn Rand and Other Heresies, which is very good. He talks, yeah, which I have on my shelf and I, need, I haven't pulled down in ages, so I forget exactly what he addresses there but, yeah, atheism. But why know. atheism? I'm but not the sure second book is also very good. The second book is very good, too, because he discusses the ontological argument, which he doesn't get to in the first book. So he has a full discussion of it in the second book. It's a thinner book. Uh, so I thought, okay, I want something different to do while I'm self-quarantined, although I was self-quarantining before self-quarantining was cool. I mean, long before the pandemic, I was pretty much under quarantine, not going anywhere but Kroger to buy gro groceries uh, and living, living online. So it wasn't a big change in lifestyle for me. But I thought, okay, let me start this blog. April 4th, I say, I'm going to start a blog. And one of the missions I had in mind was make George's book known to atheists. So it's, you'll get the impression reading these posts that it's more directed at atheists. Than, in, than at theists. Now, it's also somewhat directed at theists, and I think they'll, I hope they'll, they'd benefit from it if they're interested. They're probably not reading it. I don't know. Not, not that many people are reading it, as far as I can tell. But um, because I hear, I hear celebrity internet atheists say things like they have call in shows, right, where theists call in to give them their concept of God, and then they shout them down and argue with them. Uh, and they say ridiculous things like, well, you know, yeah, we use reason and logic because, uh, you know, it seems to work, but we really can't prove that reason is reasonable. That's a direct quote mm -hmm. from a, a well-known internet atheist celebrity. Or the problem with logic is to refute it, you have to use it. So that's a bug, not a feature in, in, the, in these guys. And one the other day was talking about logic, and I just blogged on this. Logic is sort of like part of the social contract. I grant you logic and you grant me logic for the sake of discussing and moving forward in talking about the world. Well, I don't know why it would be worth talking about the world if we're only granting logic <laughs> as, a, as just the, the basis to have a conversation. Uh, so that's the kind yeah, of things they know, say. You know, if you, if you haven't read logic yet, then it doesn't seem as though you're entitled to pass from the premises. We want to talk about the world. Yeah. We need logic to talk about the world. Therefore, we should use logic. No, I mean, if you're not, right. if you're not into logic yet, then, you know, the conclusion right. doesn't follow from the premises until you already buy I it. Said, well, I said, how do you negotiate the contract? <laughs> <laughs> how can you negotiate the terms of the social contract if logic is, is, is going to be in the contract? Uh, so I quote, I've quoted George a lot. Not every post is in like an original piece from me, sometimes just a quotation. Yeah, I just like to try to have something every day. And so one of my missions there is to get people to see that book. It's a you know, I haven't read every book on atheism by a long shot, but it's got to be one of the most, one of the best books ever written on that subject. And it's, it's just a darn good book. Well, a lot of the, you know, I've gotten into a, lot, a lot of the sort of the public popular dispute uh, between religion and atheism is kind of philosophically impoverished. 
on both sides. I mean, there's a lot of philosophical research mm -hmm. on both sides. There are very sophisticated defenses of theism out there in the philosophical literature and very sophisticated defenses of atheism. But most of what you'll find uh, in, pop, in the, you know, the popular debates among the sort of the big names is not really, you know, engaging with any of that. And so it, it's sort of, yeah. you know, sort of, uh, you know, a, um, an unimpressive cartoon version of theism and an unimpressive cartoon version of atheism battling it out. And it's, <laughs> it's not very inspiring. Yeah, yeah, you know, actually read the good stuff. The only time I've ever heard anyone, one of the points I've been trying to make is that there's a problem with the concept of uh, the supernatural. So, exi something that exists outside of existence, that's problematic. And, uh, you know, in the end, it's nonsense. So this is a point I'm trying to make. The only time I've ever heard that raised in these debates has been by the theists where the theist says, of course, there's not going to be evidence for the supernatural. It's outside of existence. Why would you expect evidence? I still believe it. Now I take the other side. Yeah, it's outside of existence, which means we can't even say anything about it. And therefore, I'm not a theist. Uh, I've never heard an atheist, bring, uh, an atheist bring that up. So that's what I'm trying to do. Now, I've gotten into allied uh, issues epistemology and ethics, because that's always coming up, right? If there's no God, how do you ground ethics? I guess you don't believe in ethics. So they make very feeble responses to that sort of thing. And also about, you know, what can we know? If there's no God, what can we know? Uh, so the other book I've been, or booklet that I've been promoting, probably as hard as George's, is your reason and value. If you've looked, you'll see. There are quotations. I hope I haven't run afoul of a fair use. You won't care, but but I've run enough quotations over posts that not the whole book's, the whole book's not there, but, uh, but a lot, but important points are there about knowledge, about coherentism, about uh, reflective equilibration. I explained this stuff. I've talked about Quine and then, and then bring you into it about the whole holism idea and equilibrate, just trying to show that there, there are ways to argue for your position that, 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 aren't, uh, that aren't shallow. Because a lot of these atheists like, I think they like to, to pose as an edgy skeptic. Their favorite word is skeptic. I'm a skeptic. Now I know there's an everyday sense, right? Oh, I'm skeptical about that. Uh, just meaning you have doubts about a particular explanation for something somebody's told you about, or you know, some, some fact they tell you and you just say, well, I'm skeptical about that. But, but that I guess is more properly called you know, when you say, well, how do you know? And people ask that question every day of friends and whatnot. Hey, there's a new restaurant opening down the street. How do you know? That's, isn't that really evidentialism? That's not skepticism. That's evidentialism, which is fine. You want evidence for... Uh, assuming that you're open to any, you know, assuming that, that you'll accept any possible answer. Uh, you know, if you're, if you're committed to rejecting any, any possible answer, like, oh, I saw a sign in, in front right. of the grand opening today. Well, how do you know that uh, the sign wasn't put there. Oh, yeah. there. How do you know you really saw the sign? How do you know it wasn't a hallucination? How do you know you're dreaming right now? And That's so, true. Yeah, so, That's true. Yeah, uh, so, but I'm thinking the real hard very colloquially. Will, uh, right. yeah, will deny what you don't find. You, you don't find them. You don't find them among your, well, you're in a philosophy department, so I can't speak for you, but, but on the, just out on the street, I'm not going to find those types. But most so most these new atheists not into that kind of skepticism. Although. These new atheists like the, 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 the guy I mentioned, William Davis, the guy who would you know, heat up his uh, coffee in the microwave and say it was as good as espresso. He was, he was a skeptic and a divine command theorist and an existentialist. And he also explicitly denied the law of non-contradiction. Um, he was also an act deontologist. You know, there are certain acts that are just inherently right not because they belong to some general category, but just in and of themselves. He, um, yeah. he also held the unusual view, combination of views, that the Bible is literally true, all of it, but it doesn't much matter that it is. It's not that important. I, don't, I haven't very often encountered that pair of views, yeah. but it, you know, it exists. So that's, you know, that's Bill Davis. So I, I think they just like this edgy, there's an edgy sound to it. I'm a, I'm a skeptic. And, and one of them uh, was recently asked, uh, well, can you take skepticism too far? Can you go too far with your skepticism? Absolutely not. You cannot be too much of a skeptic, this guy says, uh, uh, point blank. And he'll claim to be a Humean, but he doesn't really give any evidence that he's ever read Hume. I don't think he would adopt the view that slave, uh, that slave, 
that the reason is and, and uh, can be nothing else than a slave to the passions. <laughs> Although, as I've learned from you, there's other things in Hume which go against skepticism, namely that we do inherit, sort of inherit these uh, customs and sentiments and stuff which have gone through some, the evolutionary mill, which seems yeah, to Hume really is more yield us. more complicated than the cartoon version. Well, everything is more complicated yeah. than the cartoon version. I mean, sure. that's, that's one of my... Right. My but best. they don't seem to know any of this, and yet they pronounce as if they're... You know, look, I'm an amateur philosopher. I don't have a degree in philosophy. I took philosophy courses in college, and, and I read on my own. Uh, uh, Gary Chartier likes to chuckle when I say uh, I read Wittgenstein for relaxation, which is not, not an exaggeration. I read Ryle for relaxation. I really, I like I really do. You riled up. <laughs> no, he doesn't do that. Uh, <laughs> I love him, and I love uh, Gilbert and Ryle's operas. He's wonderful. And, uh, <laughs> and, and Gilbert Sullivan is a fantastic philosopher, a really important philosopher. Not to be confused with that singer from the 60s, Gilbert O. Sullivan, who had that song, uh, Alone Again Naturally. That's somebody else. One hit wonder. So that's what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to bring the, this younger crop of atheists, I don't know if they're watching the blog, they never comment, uh, to George's book and then your stuff on ethics without religion and 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 solid you know sound funny because in my, in my in my interview with gary which is going up this weekend uh he cites uh re my work in reason and value as a way of defending religious epistemology so i looks like i'm giving aid and comfort to both wow, i'll have to hear how he, i hope he elaborates a little bit on that. that's um uh, that's good that means whoever wins i'll be in on the you know you know I, I, I if i could just say something about that that book, when I read that, I read that while you were at Fee that summer, because I remember flipping over my ID card, you know, the name card on the back, and I had written, I'm a negative coherence, coherentist, and a uh, reflective equal, equilibrationist, and I flashed it at you, and you chuckled. I was, I was reading it at that time for the first time, so I don't, I don't know when that was. I'm probably uh, the only person who would have chuckled. Yes, no one else would have known what it meant. But, you know, I came out of, uh, of a Randian background, and my first contact with philosophy, and I, you say the same thing, was, was Rand. Uh, I had the good fortune of not discovering Rand until after the split with, with Brandon, so I was not a child of that very messy divorce, thank goodness. I came in months afterwards. I I don't know if even I don't know if Brandon had yet published his response to to whom it may concern concern Rand's uh, statement of why the break occurred, and so I was detached from that. I was like, I just want to know what these people write, and you know, what I make of it. So that looks pretty good to me. So I had no stake in it. I wasn't asked to you know declare myself two sides, uh, but that was so that was my kind of working philosophical background. Uh, and I had read the epistemology, the book on epistemology. I really liked uh, uh, Peacock's uh, analytic synthetic dichotomy uh, paper, read it long ago, and uh, really enjoyed your review of that, what is it, Browning book that discusses how uh, Putnam and, uh, and Kripke said very much, very similar things to what Peacock uh, said in that paper. I found that very gratifying because I, I mean, from my lay perspective, that Peacock paper sounded like a pretty sound, sound seemed like a very strong argument. Uh, so where was I going with this? Uh, oh, I was saying something about reason and value. And I'm not exaggerating. That book, that, that, the, that, that essay is, was, was liberating. And maybe you've heard this before from other people who had a, an objectivist background. Uh, and I would regard, never regard myself as an orthodox objectivist. I was more conservative to reform, some of them. <laughs> I didn't have the, the long, well, I have the long hair now, but I didn't have it back then. Uh, it was liberating because, you know, I'd, you should talk about that book someday just on your, on, on this, uh, in this series. But, you know, you, you talk about how you're not confined to the evidence of your own senses in, in, in building up knowledge and showing how where, where Rand is weakest is where she claims she improved over Aristotle. And, and yet she did not improve over Aristotle. Aristotle is better and much more plausible and reasonable. And it's just in both ethics, flourishing versus survival. I mean, this may be esoteric for, re for viewers who haven't read the book, but they should read the book. It's well, I'll, have a, I'll have a link to it. And although yeah. it's on, it's on Kindle. Society recently dropped uh, 
drop that yeah. PDF from their site. I oh, have it, well, they they they've taken sort of a you know they've taken sort of a turn against intellectual stuff in general, and now they're mostly doing like satirical satirical yeah. videos. They also, also cheap Kindle. They also dropped Nira Badwar's uh, monograph, although I'm told that they're going to oh, put them up in an archive somewhere. But in, anyway, I, well, I posted both my and Nira's monograph. It's a cheap and Kindle, and Kindle's not very expensive. So get a Kindle if you don't have a Kindle, and then get the Roderick's book. But also, uh, it's, it's, it, the if, if you are on my site. I'll, I'll have a link to those two. Link if there. your framework is objectivism, you may be sensing that there are issues. But this book, I think, will liberate you without like throwing out the baby with the bathwater, but only throwing out the bathwater. And uh, so it, it's an extremely important book. So I want to bring it to the attention of people who probably know nothing about Ayn Rand, or uh, if they know it, they know her, they have, have a very poor uh, opinion of her and won't want to acknowledge she's an atheist because they don't want to acknowledge they have anything in common with her. Uh, so, they, so they probably, so I- No, like Rand subtle, not to call herself a libertarian because she didn't want to, yeah. Uh, have anything in common with the libertarian movement, even though by any normal definition of, of right. And as an atheist, I'm you know I'm not primarily an atheist. I'm primarily an advocate of reason uh, and liberty, of course. But I mean, in terms of uh, epistemological, mm. metaphysical things, I think Rand said this one day. You know, it's not atheism that I would put on mm. my gravestone, right? It would be rationalist or whatever, whatever she said. But uh, uh, that's a byproduct, in my view. Yeah. Although in one of her yeah. early journal writings, Rand does say, I want to be known as the greatest enemy of religion. But mm -hmm. that was before she'd really worked out her system back when she was sort of yeah. more Nietzschean and less Aristotelian than she became. Yeah, and she was not a crusading atheist. She, you know, she, I was aware she was an atheist and then they had that one lecture in the series, but, but it wasn't like they were, it yeah. wasn't like Madeline Mary O'Hare. Yeah, no, she's saying, I mean, if you compare the amount she wrote about that versus the amount she wrote about, about you know, everything else, yeah. it really wasn't the, the major. I never heard her complain that the coins say in God we trust or, you know, or, mm -hmm. you know, one nation under God, unlike Madeline Mary O'Hare. So. No, her main. So that's why I do, that's why, why I do the blog. Paper money. <laughs> that's what, well, right. That's what, that's why I do the blog and uh, I enjoy it. I'm learning more because it's pushing me to read more. And, or reread some stuff like Henry Veach, who was one of the great fans of Aristotle and interpreters of Aristotle, who I enjoy reading. I actually met him once at a Libertarian Scholars Conference back in the 70s when he did a book on uh, uh, liberty. He, he wrote a, a whole book on uh, his notions of freedom. I don't know how good it is. I, it's actually, I never, I never read it. I can't remember. I, if, I can't remember the title and I can't remember if I've read it. I, you know, I read a number of things by... Yeah. By Veach in the past. The main thing I remember was Rational Man, but I've read. Um, yeah, I have that one. I read that. Um, he, he and you know, he and Murray. He and Murray. The were book on Murray on Human Rights that I think I read. That, that may be the book I'm thinking of, right? And it's probably not you know hardcore libertarian, uh, but but it must have been friendly. Yeah, Murray yeah I know it's him. sort of a fellow traveler. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, so so it's it's uh, the blog then pushes me to read additional stuff, and I've been reading some of the earlier American. Uh, free thinkers like uh, Robert Ingersoll, who was, who was very interesting. Uh, Have you come across a, Elihu Palmer? What's the first name? Elihu, E-L-I-H-U. No, no, Palmer? No. Uh, he wrote a book called, oh, what is it called? Uh, I actually discovered him through Peacock. Peacock and the Ominous Parallels quote this passage from him. Anyway, he was a he was sort of a crusading deist. Um, okay. Yeah, a lot of them were uh, deists. Uh, but um, uh, but he has, you know, but you know, he sort of uh, he writes about revealed religion the way Spooner writes about the Constitution. Um, you know, very similar style um, okay. and style of like um, uh, And actually, you know, and of course, Spooner was a deist too, but he only wrote like a couple of pieces on yeah. on religion and I've quoted him. from then on all his later stuff uh you know makes no doesn't ground anything in in religion and makes no reference to it uh, yeah. but, but although he Tucker, said, the, Tucker he, said in his obituary that that Spooner still held the DS views of his early writings he still held them at the end but he he never makes any theoretical well, he, he, he thought religion was an insult to 
to the creator that he believed in. It was insulting, you know, <laughs> that, that heaven, that God would never would have created heaven where you sit around just contemplating the glory of God, you know, and stuff like that. It's, it's great stuff. Uh, I was always, I was long, a, a, a long been a big fan of Thomas Paine's The Age of Reason, which is a wonderful book, uh, debunking of the Bible and showing the contradictions and of course, and then, and then- That's uh, the one that got him uh, called a filthy little atheist by, um, was it by Teddy Roosevelt? Called him a filthy little atheist. And filthy little atheist. And, 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 and number one, he wasn't filthy. He was apparently complex. very clean. He wasn't little and he wasn't an atheist. But other than that. So, uh, so Roosevelt got that yeah, three uh, out of three. Called him something like a cross between a pig and a puppy or some <laughs> of phrase. Some kind of Dr. Moreau type. And then I've read a lot of I've read a lot of Spinoza's uh, analysis of the Bible. He was really the first comprehensive analyst of the Bible to show it couldn't have been written by Moses and all the historical problems. I mean, some people had suggested uh, that in some uh, in a narrow way, but he took it all. Yeah, you know, Spinoza was a and I've been reading a lot of Spinoza. Became, I've been as, but what became the um, yeah. you know textual analysis of of the yeah. Bible. Um, and I'm, a, I'm very fond of Spinoza. I like Spinoza in a lot of ways. Uh, anybody that gets excommunicated from a synagogue is okay in my book. I never would have well, been able to If it became uh, a Nazi, pretty, that might be. That's pretty good. That might be problematic. Right. Um, and we don't really know it for. They never said. Yeah. Spinoza's that politics. lifetime, very. Spinoza's politics. lifetime, very harsh. Yeah. Spinoza's politics yeah. are fairly decent. Well, but, yeah, but he, he's basically a high, he uses a Hobbesian yeah. framework but he, he says, yes. let's start from these Hobbesian premises, and then what do we end up with? We end up with, right. with a more democratic uh, state. We end up with freedom of speech and religion and various things that, uh, that Hobbes, and a non-absolutism, non things that Hobbes did not go for. So although, you know, he's not you know, political, right. he's not really, you know, purely one of us, he's definitely, he moves the, um, you know, the Hobbesian framework in that direction. Uh, actually, Doug denied And he improves on the Greeks. He has, a, yes, he does. I've read, he's got two books. One was his dissertation, and then he wrote another book. Uh, so I've read both of those. Uh, he improves also on the Greeks and on Aristotle, because he specifically says statecraft should not be soul craft. It should only be for security, the state. Uh, he's not an anarchist, of course. It shouldn't be to promote virtue or make, make the system. Who disrespects so George Will? The Greeks. Yes, he didn't, he didn't like George Will you know, pro proactively. He didn't like George Will. Uh, and so for a guy who's a determinist, for, for a guy who's a determinist, he talks an awful lot about freedom. <laughs> <laughs> so I, find, I, I like, I enjoy reading him. He's a challenge to read. He's a little bit, little, not, not, I don't want to well, Particularly the, the ethics is he, well, well, difficult to read. The, you know, the two, you know, the it's two puzzling. It's, is the, the Tractatus Politicus, the Tractatus Theological Politicus, even though the, yeah, the names right. sound daunting, uh, those are fairly easy to read, but the, you know, the ethics demonstrated according yeah, the to other one is like, geometry is, is tough going. Yeah, mimicking, mic, mimicking uh, Euclid, I guess. Uh, and then he has QED at the end of every section, right? And thus, here, yeah. I, here I proved what I said I was going to prove at the beginning. No, there's a lot of interesting stuff in that. And the appendix, yeah. appendices are interesting, his appendices. Uh, so it's, it's he's, he's, he's good. And I've been reading. Yeah, I remember when I first discovered him. And I was, I was in college, but I didn't discover him for a college course. I, uh, you know, I found uh, Spinoza text in the, probably was in the basement of the John Harvard bookstore, which is a wonderful uh, bookstore, better than the official Harvard bookstore. And I hope it still mm -hmm. exists. A lot of wonderful bookstores are closing during this pandemic, but um, uh, but that was, um, you know, I discovered then just, you know, seeing, and, and, and actually if Rand was a fan of Spinoza. Rand names uh, I mean, not a super yeah. fan, uh, but she says uh, among the philosophers that she's not uh, a devotee of, she nevertheless listed, I think she listed uh, both Plato and Spinoza as people she thought had an authentic respect for reason, even though she didn't, you know, even though obviously she wasn't completely down with them, but she has a passage somewhere. Um, Oh, what she says. Yeah, and Peacock, Aristotle and did this, and, this and so in part did Plato, Aquinas, and Spinoza, but how many others? Something like that. I think there are quite a few others, actually. And Peacock, refer, Peacock names him as one of the egoists in, 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 in the history of philosophy. 
I think you brought that quote to my attention. Uh, and, and he is, but he has the same rich view of egoism that, that Aristotle has and which you so well develop in Reason and Value, namely, it's to your interest. You'll flourish if you're surrounding yourself with people committed to using reason and you're using reason with them. And uh, he goes on a, a great length about that. It sounds like it's right out of, uh, you know, the stuff you've been writing about. He understands. So he, in other words, this line between egoism and altruism really end up getting uh, blurred properly. I think you, I think you see this uh, in, in some other earlier thinkers. Uh, you know, with a good friend, you're doing so, if you're doing something for a friend, I mean, where's really the line? Your interests, in a way, kind of merge, and uh, and that happens to some extent with the, with this, the community you're in, being being a rational social animal, uh, and and wanting to deal with people by reason. The, that line is not quite bright now. Altruism as a uh, as a as a duty, and the way Rand talks about it. You know, yeah, my my remarks wouldn't uh, cover that, but uh, but I think it's uh, again a little more complicated than some have, you know, as, than some have set it out to be. Okay, well, that's, we should, uh, we that's probably, the atheism. That's the atheism ball. We should probably uh, wrap things up now because uh, this is getting a little long, even for a two-part episode. But I definitely think that, um, <laughs> sure. This, you know, this is the longest the longest they've done so far. Um, Though it won't be oh. once I once I snip it. I uh, told you you'd have trouble keeping me quiet. But we uh, well, this, this has been a lot of I fun. Weren't, uh, I weren't. We definitely should. Uh, yeah, we definitely should come back for a uh, a part three at um, at some point because uh, anytime there are things we haven't talked about and uh, you know, and all these things and, that I would like to uh, revisit. Yeah, we, we haven't even talked right about. Here. We well, haven't, you know, even, we you haven't know, talked you know, about you know, Lyle, Wittgenstein or Gilbert and Sullivan. Except, you know, glancingly. I'm, uh, you know where I live and I'm under uh, lockdown, so uh, I'm not going anywhere. <laughs> I'm stuck. No, it's a... I'm your prisoner. <laughs> no, let me out. <laughs> well, see, was I, well, I, you know, in the I enjoyed it. Sunlight of Athens. That's right. And I, I'm just. But before we started myself. filming, I showed you my real background. Actually, let me, let me show the audience my real background, which they haven't. I don't think my audience has seen it, but just for the heck of it, I will show them what my real background is, just uh, so they can see the. Darn it! I thought that was your view. They can see the truth behind the lie. Wow, Auburn's a lot larger than I thought. So this is you know, <laughs> this is the grim reality. Also, you can see that you know. Quite a comment. Here, one reason my hair looks so weird in these videos is because. As this is the shaggiest it's ever been, and the um, uh, <laughs> Zoom seems to interpret this bit at the bottom as not being part of me, uh, and so it it <laughs> interprets as part of the background. And so then, so the reason I keep going like this is not because I'm preening, but because this long shaggy <laughs> hair keeps you know getting into my ears, and I hate it. Um, but I haven't, uh, you know. I haven't undertaken to cut my own hair because I know from experience that that doesn't go well. And but who knows when I'll actually get a proper <laughs> haircut? Or maybe it'll grow long enough that I can put it in a ponytail, which is not something I would ever have <laughs> thought I of. Can do, I, I can do that. Um, I, I can do that. Uh, but right now it's it's just long enough to be annoying, but um, not <laughs> to be able to hold back in ponytail. But you know, once I put the you know, this magical background back up. Um, it suddenly looks as though yeah, I have the, the, a haircut. But in fact, I've, yeah, got, cut, very neat I've got hair that keeps bothering me uh, and sliding forth into my ears. And so I keep going like this and no one can see the hair that I'm pushing back. And so it just looks like, oh, I'm just preening all the time. I think that when I look at the, you know, at, at my own videos, it looks like I'm just constantly preening. I'm not preening, I'm getting the stuff that crap out of my, out of my ears. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, little digression there about, uh, uh, life under lockdown. All right. Well, thanks a lot. This has been a lot of fun. We will definitely do it again. Um, uh, I say the same to you. Thank you. And it has been great fun. Enjoy it. Right. Uh, and uh, to uh, to the hordes of uh, eager viewers out there, 
Uh, take a look through the links, uh, read Sheldon's stuff, his books, his blog posts, um, some of the other stuff we've talked about that I'll have links to, and um, like, share, subscribe, all that good stuff. And I'll see you, or you'll see me, because I don't really see you. So I claim next time.